I want to talk a little bit about DivGrad and Curl. There's a lot we're going to say about these things. One of the things that we discovered in class today, and it's in the textbook, is that the curl of a gradient was equal to zero. There's lots of good, good geometric reasons for that. One of the most sort of hand wavy reasons, um, but still a good one to think about, is that the gradient of a, of a function is a vector field that always goes uphill if f is like the landscape the height of the landscape and that really shouldn't turn around it shouldn't make any if I have a fluid that's always flowing downhill it shouldn't be swirling around and curling and making things go in a circle and that's sort of an intuitive reason why curl grad f should be zero we did a calculation and it's just because if you just actually look at the calculation it's because um, of the equality of mixed partial derivatives so one way people remember that is if you use this notation del cross for the curl it looks almost like I'm taking the um, the cross product of two vector of vector with itself almost or two ver parallel vectors and that's suggestive that it should be zero now I want to see how divergence plays into that remember the divergence by definition is just dp dx plus dq dy plus dr dz if f is pi plus qj plus rk and the suggestive form of that is we take this gadget, which we call NABLA, the gradient operator, the thing that's all ready to create the gradient, if I just put a function in here, f, 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 and instead of doing that to create the gradient, I sort of formally dot this with the vector field uh, pi plus qj plus rk, and the rule is whenever I combine an operator, something that takes a derivative with a function, I just actually take that derivative. And so that creates this formula. And the claim is that's the divergence of f. Now the real point, the real proof of why this is interesting is something we still have to, to think more about. We had a, a glimmer of an idea with the divergence theorem in two dimensions that this quantity really should be something that calculates how much fluid is flowing out of, of a particular point. And the three-dimensional generalization is very straightforward. But we still want to do some more work on that. But all I want to sh show you today, right now, in this video, is how it interacts with the curl. One of the legal combinations, as opposed to many of the, the many illegal or meaningless combinations of these operators, would be to take the divergence of the curl of a vector field. Or in the, um, with this notation, del dot del cross the vector field. And I always do that. Again, it looks like this looks like a scalar triple product, A dot B cross C. That's the volume of the box with vectors A, A, B, and C. If A and B were equal, that block box collapses. So it's suggestive that that should be zero. But definitely that's not a proof. Let's think about, about the intuition we had for this one. Well, unfortunately, that kind of breaks down here. We don't have a lot of intuition for what the curl of a vector field looks like. We know, we want to get at least some intuition, that if f is curling around at a point, then we know what the curl is at that point. And we know that its magnitude says how much the vector field is spinning there or curling, and the, the direction of curl f is the axis of rotation of, of f. But now I'm going to look at all of those curls put together in a vector field, and then ask, are those arrows diverging or converging? That's not obvious. That's, I think, a pretty subtle question. And the, the idea that it was all, would always automatically be zero is pretty cool. And in fact, it turns out to be true. The proof is very simple. It's in the text. But it's just to calculate um, these quantities. The curl of f, remember, is, um, I don't need bold there, is just a 3 by 3 determinant so let's put in a 3 by 3 determinant. Formally, you put i, j, k on the top. So already, that's a little bit of a weird thing to do, because those aren't actual numbers. But we already know that from like the cross product. Then you put the function p, q, and r on the bottom, the components of f. And then you put these guys, the components, so to speak, of this del operator. Here. And so that's just writing out the 3 by 3 determinant formula for what del cross f would be. Okay. And so that reminds us exactly what we're going to get. Oh, let's put it on the next line. Okay, so we're going to get some stuff times i. And go ahead and bold that. And then 
So this is going to be d by dx, or sorry, uh, i is going to be d by dy r. So let me copy this instead. d by dy of r minus d by dz of q. And now I'm just going to copy that and change the letters. So this is going to be a j. This is going to be a k. And so there's a secret minus sign here. I'll put that in there in front of the j. And then d by dx of r and d by dz of p. And then back to plus sign. And then uh, d by dx of q minus d by dy of p. And of course, that one is the most familiar because that's the scalar curl for a, an ordinary vector field in two dimensions, dq dx minus dp dy. OK, so that's the curl. Now, what about the divergence of the curl of f? OK, I'm going to take the x derivative of this plus the y derivative of this plus the z derivative of this. OK, so let's do that. d by dx of all this stuff plus d by dy, let's see, of this stuff, ah, but with a minus sign. Let me just go ahead and use that to flip these guys. Plus d by dz of all this stuff. And then let's see what happens. Well, we get like a d by dx and dy. So d squared r by dx dy. But look what we have here. Opposite order, but that doesn't matter with a minus sign. And q gets an x and z derivative here. And it get, with a minus sign here, it gets a z and x derivative of the plus sign. And p gets a y and z derivative of the plus sign and a z and y derivative of the minus sign. It all vanishes by Clairaut's theorem. Because and that's we see that that's a really, really significant theorem all of a sudden. The equality of mixed partials is telling us these really interesting relationships between these these um, these derivatives. So this is not remotely as intuitive as the other one, but it's still the same kind of very simple calculation with Clairaut's theorem. So in particular, if whoops if I have some other vector field, some random vector field G, and the divergence of g is not equal to 0, then I know that g is not equal to curl of f for any f. It can't be the curl of some other vector field. Then the obvious question uh, asserts itself, what about the converse? What if, or what if, if the divergence of g is 0? Is it guaranteed that g can be written as a curl? That's much more subtle than the corresponding question when the curl vanishes, can it be written as a gradient? Even that is a pretty subtle question. This guy is an even more subtle one. And we're going to have to think about that some more. But this statement right here, at least, we've got rock solid, because it just is the contrapositive of this calculation. OK. Um, let me, sh let me uh, do one more video, and I'm going to do it as a separate video, about a few more calculations with uh, div, grad, and curl.